south nor winter chilling breeze by and by the harvest and the labor ended we shall come rejoicing bringing in the sheaves bringing in the sheaves bringing in the sheaves we shall come rejoicing bringing in the sheaves bringing in the sheaves bringing in the sheaves we shall come rejoicing bringing in the sheaves going forth with weeping sowing for the master though the loss sustained our spirit often grieves when our weeping's over he will bid us welcome we shall come rejoicing bringing in the sheaves bringing in the sheaves bringing in the sheaves we shall come rejoicing bringing in the sheaves bringing in the sheaves bringing in the sheaves we shall come rejoicing bring let's do it again bringing in the sheaves bringing in the sheaves we shall come rejoicing bringing in the sheaves bringing in the sheaves bringing in the sheaves we shall come rejoicing bringing in the sheaves amen Have you ever wondered how long it took for the promise of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 to be fulfilled? From Adam and Eve came Seth, but no saviour. Enos, Kaina, then Mahalalel, but no Messiah. Jared, then Enoch, who walked with God, but he was not the promised seed. Methuselah, Lamech, then Noah, who endured a flood, but he was not the one who would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and by whose stripes we are healed. Shem, Arphaxad, then Salah, but no saviour. Eber, Peleg, then Ruh, but no messiah. Serug, Nahor, then Terah, and the fulfilment of God's promise in Genesis 3.15 had not yet come to pass. But don't give up. Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob, the patriarchs, but still no deliverer. Judah, Perez, Hezron, Ram, Aminadab, Nashon, then Salmon, but nothing yet. Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Jesse, then the great King David. And I'm just wondering, when is God going to fulfill his promise? But don't give up and don't give in. Solomon, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amon, Josiah, Jehoiakim, Sheetiel, Zerubbabel, Abiad, Eliakim, Azor, Zadok, Akim, Eliud, Eliezer, Mathan, Jacob, then Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the Christ child, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, baptized in the river Jordan. He is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, promise fulfilled. No matter how long, hold on to the promises of God. I'm Pastor B, and this has been more than just a moment. Now time. Can you hear me? Okay. It is now time for prayer. Let us bow our heads and pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Lord. We thank you for bringing us here again this evening, Lord, to hear a word from you. Please be with us, speak your Lord, and impart your words um, to him, I think. Um, and bless us, Lord, to receive the message that we are to receive tonight, Lord. Be with those who are on their way and bring them safely as well. And those who are watching online, be with them and bless them also with a message from you, Lord. Please continue to abide with us and keep us in your will and your way. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to assume and believe that you had a wonderful Sabbath here today. A wonderful testimony and um, wonderful Bible study, right? And those who were not here missed something. But um, you can always continue to learn from those who are here. Amen? And eh? you took note. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so um, I saw Dr. Miller really, he was in, in his element. He was really enjoying what he was uh, sharing to him this evening. And I think we need to have more of that sharing and going into prophecy. Tonight, we're continuing our series. Um, we're not yet done. We have one more week to go. Amen? Amen. Um, and tonight, we will be um, dealing with a very important topic. And I will let Dr. Miller, the probability of Christ. And um, later on, he's going to come. But before that, remember, every night, if you have any question, health or, you know, Bible-related, write those questions down and give them to the usher at the, um, on your way out. And those online, if you also have any question, please write them down in the comments uh, on Facebook or YouTube, and we'll also give those questions to um, Dr. Miller. And uh, tonight, we'll like to invite him. I think he has couple of questions he will address. We'll give him the time now. Before he comes, if you have come here and you have not signed in, please do so because there are surprises at the end. Thank you. One question, but I want to tell you something else before I just had a thought while I was sitting there. I really enjoyed, and I appreciate those who came for the Bible study this afternoon. When you study the Bible, especially prophetic things in the Bible, it gives you a whole new religious experience. Now, I'm, I pretty much have the timeline. Yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I pretty much have the timeline down pat, and let me tell you how I did it. At UG Pines, we had an elementary school. And it got out for the summer, but I made an announcement in assembly. If anyone would like to send their child back to the school every morning, we'll spend an hour studying the prophetic periods in the Bible. Two children showed up. I can give you one guess who one of them was. That one right there. <laughs> And the other one was another girl, even younger than her, and Stacy was just a young child. Every day, we spent an hour starting with 457 and going on down the line until they knew it completely. That's how I learned it. You teach it. And I became excited about it. When you study Daniel and Revelation like you should, you have a whole different religious experience, and we need that. Okay, the question we had was, what can you do for presbyopia? It's very easy. Grow longer arms. <laughs> what is presbyopia? That's farsightedness. You can see things far away. It's up close. So you need longer arms so you can get further away so you can read it. Now, that's sort of a smarty answer. But, uh, because you'll find that as you get older, usually around 40, it starts to, you, you can't focus right. And I really believe, here's my personal belief, that we're coming into generations who will have presbyopia in their 20s because they're focused right here all the time. I see them walk, I don't understand why they've not been killed already, walking down the streets with their things. They sit there at the table, they sit there in, in the subways and the trains. I wonder, how do they know when to get off? They're either asleep or on the middle of their, their their mobile devices doing whatever, I have no idea. But there are things you can do. You see, how many have ever broken a bone? How many have ever broken an arm? Anyone ever broken an arm? I'm the only one that broke an arm. Okay, I broke both of these bones, the radius and the ulna, when I was in the fourth grade. Cast, two months. So my arm was resting, right? Getting lots of rest. 
when they cut the cast off, was it ready to go, all that rest? No, it was weak as water. It got thinner. And it was nasty. It took a while to get the strength back. The same with the eyes. If you do not exercise your eyes, you will lose the ability for those muscles. You got six muscles that pull it in a different uh, matter of fact, sometimes when you can't see up close, just push your eyes, and sometimes you'll push your eye into the shape that can see closer. So here's what you need to do. You need to exercise the muscle. How do you exercise the muscle? Well, you can take your finger, put it out in front of you, and without moving your head, you follow it all the way back into your peripheral vision. Now, I've got pretty good peripheral vision, and you take it back out, and you come back again. And you do this back and forth. And then you go up and down. Not moving your head. You've got to move because it's muscles that's moving your eye. And then you go from far out, bring it close. Now you're changing the focal field, which is going to exercise those muscles. And you go out and in, out and in, out and in. And the more you exercise those muscles, the stronger they become. And now they're going to start pulling your eye into the shape to be able to focus on the thing that you're looking at. Now we use glasses and surgery. These are just quick fixes. They don't cure the problem. We need to cure the problem. It's like taking blood pressure me medication for high blood pressure. Does that cure high blood pressure? No more than glasses cure presbyopia or myopia or anything else. So we got to start exercising the muscle. Now there are certain things that we can take that are good for the eyes. Blueberries, great for the eyes. In Europe you got bilberries. Um, vitamin E is for the eyes. You got and, all right, your orange, your yellow vegetables, high in vitamin E. We need to start giving our eyes good nutrition. And drinking water, what is inside your eyeball? Vitreous fluid. If you're not drinking enough water, your eyes are going to suffer because of it. Matter of fact, your body is, is good in conservation. If you're not drinking enough water, you're going to conserve water by the body saying, let's don't give them any water to do this. Let's don't give them any water to do that. And you're going to start having symptoms of dehydration. Chapped lips, sick, symptom of dehydration. What do most people do when they get chapped lips? They get chapsticks. Now let me ask you a question, Judy. Um, is um, chapped lips caused by not enough chapstick? <laughs> no. Then why do we put chapstick, which is a petroleum product? So we rub petroleum on our lips to moisten them when we could just drink the water. We get sores in our mouth because of dehydration. We get dry skin because of dehydration. But the eye is filled with vitreous fluid. We drink our water. We practice the eye exercise, and you do it every day. It will strengthen those muscles. And there are also some herbs. Eye Bright and Feverfew are good herbs for your eyes. I had a, a barber. He wasn't didn't have a shop anymore, but he had a barber shop in his garage. The guy was 89 years old. You gotta hold your ears while he's cutting, okay? Anyway, I recommended to him he start taking Feverfew. The next time I came from a haircut, he says he'd gone back three prescriptions. And he was 89 years old. Folks, we don't rust out, we wear out because we're not exercising. You don't exercise your body, you're going to get tired, you're not going to have the mitochondria that you need. If you don't exercise your eye, matter of fact, if you're in a close job, I spend too much time right here looking at this thing. My eyesight has gotten much worse since I came into the computer age. We should look up every 15 minutes and look as far away as we can, and maybe even do some exercises. Start doing that. Every time you pause, do your exercises, and you will basically reverse presbyopia, and you might get your eyesight back. That's the only question I had. Um, you've got, well, tomorrow night and Wednesday night and Friday night for more questions. So write them down. If you're watching on out there and wherever you're watching, send the questions in. I'm glad to answer them. 
And if you, if you want to say, what can I do for cancer, I'm not gonna stand here in two minutes and explain, but I will give you a protocol for cancer. Five pages of things that you can do. And that's what you need to do, is get things, say, what can I do naturally to restore proper health to my body? Okay, now we got time for the song. Let us stand down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied, singing glory to his name. I'm singing glory to his name. Precious name, singing glory to his name. There at my heart was the blood applied, singing glory to his name. I am so saved from sin. Jesus, so sweet abides within there at the cross where he took me in singing glory to his name i'm singing glory to his name precious name singing glory to his name there to my heart was the blood applied singing glory to his name come to the fountain so rich and sweet cast thy poor soul at the savior's feet plunge in today and be made complete Singing glory to his name. I'm singing glory to his name, precious name. Singing glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Singing glory to Now I'm going to start right this minute on the topic because they've got to get the whole thing wired out here. Um, but I wanted to say something. I hope my daughter doesn't get upset because I'm not going to tell the whole story. But something happened a few days ago to a person who had really caused her a lot of pain, a lot of anguish. Uh, something pretty bad had happened to this particular person. and. You know, when, when someone hurts us and something happens to them, we usually will say what? Yeah, God's going to get them. He's getting them back. She, had, she was crying for that person's pain. That's forgiveness. That is a changed heart. And when, she, when just telling me that story and seeing the way she was reacting to it, I realized I need that. Too often, we, we, we want God to reap vengeance upon people. Okay, now we're ready to do the story right here. Does anyone recognize that picture? No, not Pearl Harbor. I'm afraid that many of you in the military now have never been there and will never be there. That is Subic Bay. Subic Bay of the Philippines. And that just happens to be CVA-7, which was transferred in, or became an LPH called the Tripoli. 
I served in that ship. It's tied up at the dock there. Well, I don't know where that went. Tied up at this dock over here. That one just got collapsed into the sand dunes there. But anyway, I was there on a Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, 1974. And we were happy campers. Because one thing, you do not want to have a great big meal of stuffing and turkey and everything else on the high seas. Why? Because you'll be feeding the fish with it. And we were going to be in the Philippines for Thanksgiving. But there is a problem brewing out in the Pacific Ocean, and its name, I think his name was Irma. Typhoon Irma. This was 1974. And it was a bad one. And later on that evening, on that Wednesday, the task force commander said, we've got to go. We've got to leave this place. We've got to head for Okinawa, 800 miles away. So our task force departed from Subic Bay. This is, this is the ship that I served on. It was a great place. Now, if you've ever served, how many of you have ever served in a Navy ship? Yeah, that's pretty cool. In the back of the Navy ship, we have a thing called a fantail. Ever been to the fantail? It's sort of a, an open place at the back of the ship where you can stand there and, you know, they fish off of it. Can't do much fishing when you're going so fast in the water, but a lot of things happen there. But at nighttime, they have a fantail watch. That's his job out there. And we've got a typhoon coming. Now, it's coming up pretty fast, and the seas were high. This is my picture I was taking from the Tripoli at an unrep ship. This isn't during that particular time, but seas can get pretty high out there. As sun was setting, we were getting into typhoon. It was bad. And there was that typhoon watch down below, or the, the watch on the fantail of our ship. When his relief came, now he, was a, he had a earphones and a, and a headset on attached with comm wire to the, to the bridge. His replacement came down to replace him probably about 4 o'clock in the morning. And all there was was broken comm line. Apparently he was swept overboard in the middle of the night in the middle of the South China Sea. Everything stopped. Ships turned around, helicopters launched, everyone broke out their binoculars, looking, looking, looking to see if they could find that man who was out there somewhere in the water. We looked to about 11 o'clock in the morning. I remember very well, very gray day. Waves were high, wind was blowing, typhoon was coming on, and finally the task force commander says, we've got to go. And I've often thought about that man. I've often thought about that man. What if he was still alive? And he was out there, and he saw the helicopters going back to the Tripoli. He saw the ships turning north and disappearing over the horizon. He knew that he was lost. He knew that he would die there. That's what people are going to feel at the end of time. And even worse than that, when they realize they've spurned all of God's offers for mercy. The, the angels that he sent, the people that he sent to them to try to find them, to bring them into safety, to bring them in onto the ship, they've spurned all those things, and they're going to feel it just like Christ felt it when he was hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I, I mentioned a statistic last night. I asked you how many different religions are there in the world? Does anyone remember how many different religions, major religious bodies in the world? 10,000, hmm? 10,000 10, different religious bodies. All right, one of those is Christianity. Now within the Christian community, how many different denominations do we have? How many? 33,000 different religions. And you know what? We all use the same word. That's why it was good to study this afternoon. Because if we do not understand what we believe, and, and I encourage you to come Wednesday night because I'm going to give you a personal testimony about the topic 
Wednesday night because I did not understand what I believed, even though I was brought up in that belief. All right, the ultimate resource, all scripture, how much of it? All. Is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Oh, that's a bad word anymore, perfect. Can we be perfect? In Christ, we can be perfect. Amen. Now, will we be a sinner? Yes, we'll be a sinner. When, when will we stop being a sinner? When this mortal will put on immortality. When will we stop sinning? Not at that point. If you've not stopped sinning, when Jesus comes, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Okay? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. What does it mean, thoroughly furnished? We have a work to do. We've got to have the equipment to do it with. A carpenter has his tools on his belt. Without those things, he's worthless. We've got to have the tools in our mind. Your word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. We should be storing up God's word in our minds. All right, Ecclesiastes 3.11. Matter of fact, Ecclesiastes uh, 3 was a popular song in the 1960s. Does anyone know what the song was? Turn, turn, turn. Has anyone ever heard that song? To everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die. Basically, it's talking right out of the Bible. It was, a, it was a nice song. It wasn't a beat and syncopated and the drums going on. Very interesting. It says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Folks, it may not be beautiful now, and my daughter understands this, but God is going to make it beautiful in the future. Amen. Why? What promise do we have about that? Romans 8, 28, and we, verse three words, and we know, and now we'll be looking at I won't give you the way right now, we'll look at it later. He has made everything beautiful in its time, also he has put what? It says, now in the King James it says the world, but the marginal reading says he's placed eternity in your hearts so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. What does it mean he's put eternity in our heart, his heart? What does that mean? He has put an eternal size hole in every one of us, a longing after something outside of ourselves, a, a longing for what is there beyond this, a longing to know who God is. He's put that in there. But what does man do? He tries to fill that eternal size hole with everything else. He can try to do it with drugs. He can try to do it with alcohol. He can try to do it with all the entertainment. People are numbing their minds down by getting their minds involved in all these different things. He can do it with rock music, all this entertainment. He can do it with, I gotta put my glass, I can't even see what's happening on that one. Oh yeah all those things, he can do it with all the trappings of success. But that will never fill the eternal size hole. Only one thing can fill an eternal size hole, and what is that? He who inhabits eternity. Come on, there he is, Jesus Christ. The only one who can do it. All right, go to John. We talked about this verse probably every time I've talked to you. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This is, John, this is Jesus, and this is John the Baptist talking to his disciples, and he sees Jesus walking by. He says, Behold, look there. There he is. There's the Lamb of God. What type of language is that? It's sanctuary language. The Lamb of God. Now, why did there have to be that Lamb of God? Let's go back to the very beginning. We talked about this, my very first meeting. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, because in the day that thou eat thou of, what's going to happen? You will surely die. There's no question, there's no doubt. If you eat of this fruit, you are kaput, you are going to die. All right, Genesis 2, verse 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones 
and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called what? See, we always say Adam and Eve. It wasn't Adam and Eve. It was Adam and woman. Now, we're going to see where that comes in. There's a reason why we got the name Eve. Because she was taken out of man. So her name was woman because she was taken out of man. Then we go to chapter 3. It's talking to Satan. Don't get in an argument with Satan. You cannot win the argument. What should you say to Satan? What did Stacy say today? Get thou behind me. It is written, okay? Thou shalt not surely die. And she's, it says, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And what happened at that very moment? That's right, the separation. Isaiah 59, verse 2, it says, because your sin, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. There is now that separation. Why did they not die? Jesus stepped in. But can anyone tell me where the first gospel sermon is in the Bible? First gospel sermon. It's the book of Genesis. Third chapter. Verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between thy seed and what? Her seed. What does her seed mean? Is she a gardener? Is she going to plant corn this year? Hmm? Children. She's going to have children. Adam heard that. It shall bruise thy head. Who, who's going to bruise his head? The seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. That guy, he just brought us down those 42 generations right down to Jesus Christ. It shall bruise thy head. Thou shalt bruise his heel. All right? Now, Genesis 3, verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Why did he, call his, why did he change her name? It was a memorial to his belief in what God said. God in chapter 2 says, the day that you eat this tree, what's going to happen? You're going to die. Did they believe him? No, they believe the devil. But when Jesus says, the woman's seed, Adam says, we're going to have children. And he believed. And so as a memorial to that, he called his name, the, her wife's name, the mother of all living. Now it's interesting, if you look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, it says, she has a baby. And was, read, someone read Genesis 4, 1. Okay, but other translation says it differently. I have acquired a man, the Lord. They thought this is the one. This is the one that's going to bruise Satan's head. Were they wrong? Dead wrong. Who was he? Cain. What did he do? Who was he? The first murderer. He killed his brother. They had to wait. Matter of fact, they never saw it fulfilled. He lived over 900 years seeing the earth degenerate. We're told that when he saw a leaf fall from a tree, he mourned more than we mourn for the loss of a loved one. I didn't grasp that until my big sister died four years ago. I've never felt this pain in my heart my whole life as when Kathy died. And that's how he felt more than that when he saw a leaf die. We go home, when I go home at the end of this month, I'll be home for one day, it's in the fall. All oh, the beautiful trees turning color. That's a death. It's all death. And what we revel in it, we like to go up to New England to the leaf peeper time. We don't understand. Generation 321. Under Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skins and clothe them. Where do skins come from? And what, yeah, which animals? The first sacrifice. God had Adam kill some animals and he made their first garments, coats. Not this little, you know, loincloth and this little thing that goes across the shoulder. I believe that they were 
decent looking clothing that were even modest, even though there's only two people left, even though two people so far. But he made the coats and they had to walk off. I like the way C.D. Brooks says, as they walked out of the Garden of Eden, because they had to leave the Garden of Eden, Eden with those with those skins slapping against their thighs, that bloody things, reminding, this is what you're doubting me called. Don't doubt God. He says, yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. We'll be looking at that one again, too. There's so many good promises here. Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names were not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When Adam sinned, Jesus, at the foundation of the world, stepped in and says, I'll take his punishment. I will die for Adam, and I will die for woman. What a God. What a God. Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jeremiah 31, 3. I said if we get to it. The Lord had to have appeared to me of old, saying, Yea, I have loved you with what? What does that mean, an everlasting love? It, it will never die, but there's something else about it. It has always been there. God knew you before you were conceived. Before your mother was conceived, before your grandmother was conceived, before Adam was created, he knew you. I like, there was a song some years ago, when Jesus was on the cross, you were on his mind. Matter of fact, when Jesus left the upper room and walked to the Garden of Gethsemane, he started feeling your sins piled upon his shoulders. Is the weight of sin heavy? Have you ever been guilty about something? Let me just step aside and tell you a little story right now. Um, this was back in the late 80s. I was at Uchi Pines, medical missionary, all those things. But I remember something I did in the mid-60s. I'd been in a bar. There was a poster of Peter Fonda on a motorcycle on the wall. And I thought, I like that thing. And I took it from the wall, rolled it up, and I stuck it down my trouser leg, and I walked out with it. I stole it. I was three sheets of the wind. That's no excuse. But now I'm a medical missionary back in the church, late 80s, and God reminds me of that night. So I had to get on my truck and drive the 600 miles from Alabama to Cincinnati, Ohio. I went to a store and I bought a much nicer, full color, expensive poster to replace it with. I walked back to that bar, still there, still a young people's bar. I walked in, people sitting all around the bar. I walked up and the bartender says, what can I get you? I says, I really don't want anything, but I need to tell you a story. And I told him about the night that I stole the poster off the wall. And I says, I just feel like I've got to return it. And he says, well, the, the bar's been sold since then. I says, yeah, the bar's probably been sold, but when you sell the bar, you sell with the glasses and the tables and the chairs and everything on the walls. I says, I've got to replace the poster. He didn't, and everyone stopped drinking. Everyone's looking at me like, what's this? <laughs> But then he said the most amazing words. God put the words in his mouth. You know what, we, you know what he said? Uh, Why well, forgive you? And then he says, can I get you a beer? I says, that's what got me in trouble in the first place. And I walked out, and all the weight was off my shoulders, and I just started crying. But Jesus felt that weight along with the 10,000 and more sins I've committed in my life and your sins and everybody's sins of everyone who's ever lived. He felt everyone and almost crushed out his life on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, um, biblical proofs of Christ's Messiahship. Now, we're not going to look. There's over 300 proofs in the Bible that Jesus Christ was who he said he was. We're only going to look at eight. Now, there's a book been written on this, and it's basically, it does a, the, the sermon title is The Probability. You know what probability is. If you have a, a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you throw it up in the air, how many times is it going to land with the peanut butter and jelly down? 
usually almost every time because the peanut butter is heavier than the bread, but we won't look at that one right there. But we're going to look at what the Old Testament says and see its fulfillment in the New Testament. All right, Micah 5.2. But thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth he shall come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler of Israel, whose going forth had been from old, from when? What is that? Who's it talking about there? Jesus. So was Jesus created sometime in the past? Was he begotten sometime in the past? No, he's been from everlasting. Be careful, folks. This is another thing creeping into Christianity, that Christ was a created being. He wasn't, he was God. Okay, so that's what it said back in Micah. Now, in each one of these Old Testament slides, there's going to be a date. This one was 686 B.C., a long time before Jesus Christ. This is before Daniel, all right? Here it is in John 742. Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Matter of fact, that's where the wise men, they came to Jerusalem. Where's the king? They said, well, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. They knew it. They knew it. Did they accept him? Didn't accept him. No excuse. Okay, next one, Daniel 9.25. And we tried to talk, I didn't get far enough in this today, but here it is. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. And remember, What's the, what's, the, what's the key word there? Restore. Not just rebuild it. They had to restore it to sovereignty. Unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. Now we talked about Aber, Bacon, Dita, and, uh, and all those things today, but basically it's looking at when Christ is being born. All right, Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. What does it mean, the fullness of time? What time? Daniel's prophetic time. If you look back in, in uh, John, the second chapter, Jesus' first miracle. What was Jesus' first miracle? Turning the water into wine. His mother comes and says, they're out of wine. And what did Jesus say? My time's not yet. He knew what time it was. When his brother says, let's go up to Jerusalem, he says, my hour's not yet come. Your hour always is. My, he knew what time it was. Then you get to John chapter 12. He says, my hour is come. Jesus knew what time it was. I, and I told you this the other night. There's only two correct times. There's God's time and there's military time. Are we on time, guys and girls? We better be on time because it's a court martial offense to be one minute late. Miss movement. Try missing movement one time. Oh, I missed my boat. Big trouble. Deep kimchi. All right, Psalm 41, verse 9. Even my close friends in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. 1,000 B.C. Now, what they do when they do probability is saying, how many people might that have happened to? How many people lived during that 1,000 years that that might have happened to? And they come up with a problem. One in a thousand, one in ten thousand, one in a hundred sometimes. So they're doing all these things. And it's a bigger story, but we're just going with this. Luke twenty-two forty-eight. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? Can you imagine what prompted Judas to do that? Psalm 22, verse 18, they part my garments among them, they cast lots upon my vesture. How could that just randomly happen like evolution? A thousand years before it happened, as Jesus hung on the cross, it says, let us not rend it. These are the soldiers down below, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, and it goes on what is said. And we just quoted the scripture, all right? So there's no, all right, here's another one. Psalm 22, verse 15, another thousand year one. Matter of fact, Psalm 22 is filled with prophecies of Jesus Christ. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws, and thou hast brought me unto the dust of death. 
Jesus Christ said seven things on the cross. Study it sometimes. I do a sermon on the seven things Jesus said. Very interesting. John chapter 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. He felt now the thirst. But what did they offer him? Vinegar and gall. It was basically sour wine, but there was a stupefying potion in there. They were allowed to give the prisoners something that would deaden the pain. It says when Jesus had tasted it, he died. Another one it says when he tasted it, he would not drink it. Why? Why? Jesus did not take this even though his mouth was so dry. Why did he not take it? Because he realized we, we stay connected with God by our frontal lobe. This is your spirit, your frontal lobe. And alcohol impairs your frontal lobe. And he could not lose connection with his father. Anything we do that disconnects us from the father puts us in a very dangerous situation. It puts us on Satan's ground. Exodus 12, verse 46. In one house shall it be eaten. You're talking about the Passover here. Thou shalt not carry forth out of, out of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall you do what? You will not break a bone of it. Now, Jesus was crucified with two other prisoners. What would normally kill a prisoner? No, breaking the legs didn't kill him. Well, it sped it up. But what if they were crucified on Monday? They, they broke the legs because it was coming onto the Sabbath. What happens after a while, they just can't push up anymore, and they slump down, and the lungs and the chest goes to sleep. It paralyzes it, and they suffocate. But now they got to speed up the process. For those things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him was not broken. They broke the other two. There's a picture of them breaking the other two men being crucified. They broke their legs so they can no longer push up. Now they're going to slump, and within 10 minutes, they're going to be dead. But they realize Jesus was not dead. For these things were done that the scriptures be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. They pierced him with a spear, and blood and water came out. Prophecy telling us these things. Zechariah 12, verse 10. And they shall look upon him who they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. This is quoting that scripture back there. They were down there. And what were the disciples saying? We thought it was him. We thought they still didn't believe. Jesus told them two days before, in two days we're going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified. And the next thing, here comes Peter and uh, James and John's mother saying, grant me a request that my son's going to be on your right hand or on your left hand. Who ended up on the right hand and on the left hand? Two thieves. Do you think she really wanted her sons to be crucified with Jesus Christ? No, they didn't understand. And we don't under, we're just as dull of understanding as they were. Jesus is giving us warning after warning. Read Luke, the 17th chapter, and you're going to find two warnings. And then you go over to, to, uh, to Isaiah, I think it's 57, no, 59. You're going to see the third warning. We're living at the end of time. We can talk about that later. Okay, Psalm 21, verse 1. First part of the verse, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A thousand years before he said one of those seven words was this, Eloi, Elo, lama sabachthani. Why did he feel that way? This was somewhere between the sixth and the ninth hour. Three o'clock and six o'clock in the evening. What was happening during that time? Darkness, complete darkness. And we're told that Christ could not see through the darkness. He could not see through the tomb. We talked about this the other day. He was willing to take the second death, 
that you never have to taste of the second death. Here it is. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice. He's been three hours in darkness. This is the first time in all eternity he could not sense his father's presence. He could not hear his voice. He could not see him. He could not feel him. There is no connection at all. And he cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means interpreted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what the finally impenitent will be saying. This is what they're going to feel. They're going to feel what Jesus Christ felt on the cross. He could not see through the tomb. He knew that he would never see his father again. But one thing kept him on the cross. Two things kept him on the cross. What two things kept him on? And don't say the nails. What two things kept him on the cross? His love for you and his faith in his father. He had faith in his father, even though, as Stacy's talking about this morning, he had no sense. He had, no con he had nothing to tell him that that was the reality. Folks, if you are depending upon feeling to get you through the dark times, you're going to be sadly mistaken. It's got to be faith and wrong. And how do you get that faith? You go through the hard times now. When you go through hard times now, when you succeed, it gives you strength to go through the next hard time. Okay, we talked about the probability of Christ. The probability of Christ fulfilling eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. That's a very big number. Um, this comes from a very interesting book, it's Peter Stoner and Robert Naiman. Newman. You can get the book. It, you might have to search for it, but that's a, it's a great book, on the, and it doesn't just mention eight. It mentions over 300. The probability. Does anyone know how many atoms there are in the visible universe? 10, time, 10 to the 80th power. How many subatomic particles? 10 to the 81st power. I mean, these are big numbers, 10 to the 17th power. Let me, all right, a graphic way of understanding how big that number is. The state of Texas, that's our second largest state. Alaska's bigger. The second largest state. If they covered the entire state two feet deep in silver dollars, and then they took one of those silver dollars and they put a black mark on it, and they buried it somewhere in the state of Texas under two feet of silver dollars. And then they sent a blind man out there and said, go out and find that thing. If he could find that silver dollar the first try, that's the probability. 10 to the 70. Now, some of you may not know how big Texas is. Well, let's put it a different way. It would be 576 Okinawans. Okinawas. If you put 576 Okinawans together, covered with two feet of silver dollars. Two feet's about two-thirds of a meter, and uh, one of them has a mark. There's no way Jesus is not Messiah. He fulfilled every prophecy. There's a few prophecies in the Bible that have not been fulfilled, but everyone's been, been fulfilled about him. He came here as a prophet. Did they accept him as a prophet? Did not. Matter of fact, he's got three roles. First one was as a prophet. What was his second role? It's the one he's in right now. He's a priest. What's the third role? King. And he's going to, one of these days, he's going to walk out of the most holy place. He's going to take off his priestly vestments and put on his kingly robes. And he's going down here to get us. But when he was here as this, they did not accept him. They I certainly didn't accept him as the son of God. Now, I wanted to show you something. I might have talked about this story already, but it's something that we need to understand. This is a wonderful story. It's not a parable. This really happened. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there... Now, whenever I teach this to other people, I say, read the verse carefully, because I'm going to ask you a question when I get done with reading the verse. Teaching there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Who was in the room? It just mentions Pharisees and doctors of the law. Now, I believe there are other people there, but it mentions those people there because of something else. What's the last part of the verse? To heal 
them. To heal who? The Pharisees and the doctors of the law. What was their sickness? Did they have leprosy? Well, they might have the leprosy of sin. They had unbelief, and that's pretty much incurable. They had, all right, so that's, what God, that's who God wanted to heal while they were there. And behold, men brought in a, on a bed a man which was taken with palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. Could they get in? Why? So many people in there. So what they do? They go up on the rooftop. So they went up on the rooftop and let him down through the tiling with a couch into the midst of Jesus. Now the next verse. Very important. Stacy's talked about this a couple of times. And when he saw what? When he saw their faith. Whose faith? The Pharisees and doctors of the law? No, the four guys who let him down that brought him before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he looks down and he says, what? Thy sins be forgiven you. What does that tell us? You can bring people before the Lord without their even knowing it. And say, Lord, bless this person. Heal this person. Forgive this person. We can do this. We can, we can bring the people within the circle of God's love. They may not even want to be there, but you can take them there. And when you do that, there's a divine influence placed upon them. They've got to consciously reject it. Now, go on. And when they, he saw their faith, he said unto him, all right, we already looked at that. All right, let's go to the next verse. Okay, so now we've got the scribes and the Pharisees here, right? And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this that speaks blasphemy? Blasphemy. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, who is this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? This is the one time they were right. Can anyone else forgive sins? I mean, you can't pray to Mary and get your sins forgiven? They do it. You can't um, cut yourself and flagellate yourself and get your sins forgiven? People do it. Can you go to that man in that little room and say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned? Can he, get, can he forgive your sins? Cannot do it. Can you put an extra big offering in the offering plate? to have your sins forgiven. That's what Tetzel was doing back during the time of Martin Luther. He was selling indulgences. You buy an indulgence, you can do anything you want. Matter of fact, true story, an indulgence seller was selling indulgences, which basically means that if you buy this thing, no matter what you do, you're forgiven. So the guy says, now you're telling me that if I buy your indulgence, no matter what I do, I'm forgiven? The guy says, that's right. He says, okay, good. He buys the indulgence, and then he puts it in his pocket, and then he robs the priest, takes all of his money. Well, he has him arrested, and uh, he's before the judge, and uh, the judge says, did you buy one of his things? Did the priest tell you that you could do anything uh, if you buy the indulgence? He says, he did. He says, all right, case dismissed. You're free to go. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't work that way. Uh, can you light a candle? It's interesting. I was in... Um, I was in Thessalonica, early this year. You've heard of Thessalonians. I was in that city. And they got a big church there, and there's boxes of candles. There's a little candle, and a bigger candle, and a bigger candle, and a bigger candle. There are some candles as big as me. So if you're a bad sinner, you've got to buy one of those big ones. That's going to cost you about 15 euro. So you light that candle, that takes care of your sins. Does that really take care of your sins? Does not do it. Uh, how about soaking yourself in the sacred river, going on a pilgrimage to Fat Fatima? There's only one way to get your sins forgiven. Stacy mentioned that verse this morning, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins to him, not to anybody else, he's faithful and just. He can do this. Why can he do it? Because he died for those sins. Now he's, he can just, justly forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Hebrews 7.25, wherefore is he, he is able to save them to the uttermost, that's as far as you can go, that come to God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for him. 
That's what he's doing right now. He's the great high priest standing before the throne of God, pleading for us, saying, Father, my sin, my, my blood, my blood, look at me. He was 218. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them who are tempted. Was Jesus tempted? You just look at the wilderness. Matter of fact, something interesting about the wilderness temptation. We find this in Matthew, the uh, fourth chapter. It says, after he was baptized, he is driven of the spirit into the wilderness, where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. What does it say next? It says, afterward, he was hungry. And how many of you ever fasted for more than just a couple of days? Okay. There's a point where you're no longer hungry. You can just tool along for a long time. Did it for 10 days one time. That's why I look like this. No, not really. Okay. Anyway, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, did not feel the hungry, but at the 40 days, he says he was hungry. How hungry was he? He was hungry to the point of death. You see, you've got to have fuel. What's the favorite fuel the body has? Glucose, all right? You've got glucose. His last meal is in his system. Pretty soon that's used up. What goes next? Glycogen, stored in the liver, stored in the muscles. Converted by glucagon into glucose, he's got that energy. That doesn't last long either. What happens next? What's, what's going to be burned next? Fat. All right, so now, and did Jesus have fat? We all have fat. If you didn't have fat, you'd be dead. So now, you, and that's really true, you gotta have cholesterol, it holds your cells together. So now, it starts eating up that excess fat in his body. It doesn't take long, he doesn't have a whole bunch of it on his body. What's the next fuel? Protein, muscles. Now he starts eating away at the, matter of fact, it says he was marred more than any man. When he came out of the wilderness, he was hardly recognizable. He lost so much weight. So now it's starting to, his, his biceps, his triceps, his pectorals, his quads, his, everything starts to be reduced because he's, uh, his body's using it. It gets to a point where you can't take, there's no more fat, there's no glucose, gluc glycogen, and the muscles are almost gone. So the body's looking around, what else can we break down? And it looks over there at the heart and the lungs and the kidneys and the liver, and it says, let's do those. And the body says, whoa, we've got to send a message for this man to eat. So he gets the message, and you have never in your life, you may feel like you're not going to live till tomorrow morning if you don't get a snack when you get home tonight, but you will live. He, he realized the plan of salvation will end if I don't get something to eat. And at that point, Satan shows up. And what was the first temptation? If you be the Son of God, command these stones to be made into bread. And what was Jesus' answer? It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every time Satan came with a temptation, Christ says, it is written. And finally he said what Stacy said, get behind me, Satan. And Satan had to leave. Because God used, Christ, who was God, used the word. Hebrews 5.3, though he was a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. He came here as a man. He suffered things, and he learned things through the suffering. When Jesus came here to earth, he left his omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence in heaven. It says that he grew in stature and wisdom. Now, if he came with all of his wisdom of, of omnipotence, uh, of omniscience, he wouldn't have to grow. He had to grow just like you and I do. Raise your children right, and they can be like Christ. In the word, all the time. All right, Luke 5.22. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered, and we're going back to the story where I just took a sidestep there. He answered and said to them, why reason you in your hearts? What was, what was their reasoning in the Pharisees' hearts? This man's committing blasphemy. Jesus comes back. 
What is easier to say, your sins be forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? See, now we have to enter into the Jewish mind. Their mind was, if you were sick, it meant that you were a sinner. If you were well, it meant that you were righteous. And so basically, it was, that's why, remember Simon the leper? He was a Pharisee, and Jesus healed him of leprosy. And so what does he do? He invites him to supper. Big deal. Okay? But that you may, what? No. Know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. It, that you may know according to your own reckoning. I'm going to prove to you that I am the Son of God. He said unto the sick with palsy, I say unto you, arise, take up your couch, and go to your house. And the guy lays there and says, I'm paralyzed, I can't do it. Is that what he does? No, it says, and how long? Immediately, Immediately he arose up before them and took, up, took that thereupon he laid, and he departed to his own house, glorifying God. What did Jesus just do? He proved that he was God. Because if your mind says, if the man is sick, he's a sinner, and you take away the sickness, what else did you take away? And only God can do that. That's by their own admission. You see that. But this was a mindset that permeated the entire Jewish economy. His own disciples, John, the ninth chapter, verse 2, or verse 1. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. And what did his disciples say? Who did sin? This man or his parents that he should be born blind. They just didn't get it. Now, it was funny. We sit there and think, man, they were so ignorant. They were so slow of understanding. We're no better. We're no better. We're not living any better than they were living. Because we've got their example to look at what they were doing, and yet we still won't come and give everything to God. Jesus goes on. Jesus answered, neither this man has sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest. He says, this is going to glorify God. I was in, I think, Serbia when this happened last year. You probably remember hearing about it. Ethiopian Flight 302 out of Addis Ababa to Nairobi. Antonius Mavropavis missed the flight by two minutes. How do you think he felt about that? That's the picture of the guy. That's the picture of his ticket. First row, first class. He can even go to the club. It says, you, you can go to our club. You're invited to our club because you get a first class ticket. Six minutes after that plane took off, every single person on the plane was dead. It went straight down into the earth. Every one on board. I think if he doesn't know the verse, he needs to learn the verse. Romans 8, 28. But what's the first part say? And we know. Do you know this? Do you know that when something bad happens to you, that God has a plan? So much better than the plan that we can have. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. I take so much faith in that. I see what my daughter goes through, but I realize she loves God. And if you can grasp hold of that, and she does, all things are going to work together for good. Better than she could have planned out for herself. Matter of fact, quit trying to plan your own life. We're told that when Jesus woke up each morning, he made no plans for himself. Now, it's not saying you don't have to have, you know, a schedule that you go by, but we need to wake up in the morning and consecrate ourselves to the Lord. The very first thing. If the Son of Man, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. We need to be free of all these things that are keeping us held in. Jeremiah 31.3, I talk about it all the time. The Lord hath appeared of old as in me, yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That means he's always loved you. Therefore, with loving kindness, he's arranged circumstances throughout your life 
drawing you to himself. Everything that happens to you is God's attempt to get you closer to him. He wants a relationship with you. Now let's go to the upper room. This is all in John the 13th chapter. He basically does it the best. It says, supper being over, Satan's already put it into Judas' mind to, to um, betray his Lord. Jesus gets up from the table. He girds himself with a towel. He gets a basin of water, and he begins washing the disciples' feet. Did he begin with Peter's feet? No, he didn't begin with Peter. How about James' feet? How about John's feet? What, well, James gone? Okay, John's? Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, it wasn't them. Whose feet did he begin with? Judas' feet. While the water was still clean, and when Jesus touched his feet, his whole body, Judas' whole body thrilled, and he wanted to confess, Lord, do you know what I've done? And Jesus would have said, yes, I know what you've done. Stay here with me tonight. We'll keep you. But then he let it pass. He was in what's called the golden moment. Now, Stacy didn't use that term this morning, but she says, if you leave here without making a commitment, without making a decision, I'll use the word, you missed the golden moment. When the golden moment comes, you've got to somehow confess it. You've got to go to somebody. You've got to stand up and say, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is later on, that one of you will betray me. Now, when they walked up into the upper room, all the disciples had the same mindset. Who's the greatest? That's right. It's, it's amazing. Who's the greatest? But after Jesus washed their feet, Whose job was it to wash the feet? The lowest slave in the house. They had slaves back then. The lowest one, because it was degrading. How many of you have ever been to Thailand? Okay. What happens if you show someone the bottom of your foot? See, when I went to Thailand with the commanding general of the fleet, Marine Fourth Pacific, we had to go through the protocol officer. He says, when you go to Thailand, Never show somebody the underside of your foot. Great insult. In Middle East, touching the foot is a very dirty thing. Jesus got down and he washed their feet and they were completely changed. And so when he says, one of you will betray me, you know what the reaction was? I like the way Matthew says it. Lord, is it I? There was a, there was a group called the Statler Brothers and there was one of the songs, um, Lord, is it I? They all began to cry. Lord, is it I? Is it I? Will I be the, I forget how it goes there, but it's a great song. It's Lord, is it I? But Peter beckons to John. John was leaning on Jesus' breath, and he says, ask him who it is. And so John looks up and he says, Lord, who is it? Now catch what happens here. What does Jesus say? He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. Now supper is over. Table's been cleared, but there's two, still two things on the table. What two things are on the table? There's bread. What does the bread represent? Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. In order to make bread, you've got to take the grain and do what with it? Crush it. Crush it. All right? What else is on the table? Grape juice. For this is the cup of my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. It's not wine as we see it because it could not be fermented. The bread had to be unleavened. The wine had to be unfermented. It was just pure juice of the grape. And Jesus takes a piece of bread, which represents the body of Christ. He dips it in the wine, which represents, and he gives it to Judas. What did Jesus just do? He just showed who's going to be trained, but it's something more. He just performed the very first communion service. And Judas was the recipient. Does going to communion cleanse you? It didn't cleanse Judas. 
because many of us just go to communion because that's what we do four times a year. It's, it's something we should start getting ready for communion one to two weeks before communion. It shouldn't be, um, we get up that Sabbath morning, we make sure we've washed our feet well, our toenails are clean, trimmed, we got clean socks on, we put some deodorant in our shoes, everything's going to smell nice and sanitized. And then we find our best friend and wash their feet. We've got to find that person that we have ought against. I'm going to run out of time. That's too bad. He gives it to Judas, and then, what is, then he says something to Judas. What does he say? What you do, do quickly. Now, if I were to ask you, what is he saying to Judas, you're going to say, go ahead and get out there and sell me. That's not what Jesus was saying. Why? I believe at this moment that Judas is in another golden moment. He's been found out, and he has that desire inside of him to confess what he's been planning. And Jesus is saying, say it. Do it quickly. But what does it say? Well, Jesus was holding back that. He, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was something just happened. What just happened? He just closed his probation. Never again did he feel, now, did he feel guilty later on? But was it guilty about what he'd really done? No, he just felt he did the wrong thing. He threw the money down, he went out and he hanged himself, waiting for the second resurrection. We don't want to, be, all right, one more, I'm just gonna finish the second one. Jesus, at the end of his life, was still trying to save souls. We already talked about the thief in the cross. We're going to go through him. But who else was he trying to save? How about Pilate? Was he trying to save Pilate? How did he do that? He sent a dream to his wife. And she writes a letter to him. And this is what it says. Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. And when Pilate read that, I'm sure his face blanched. Now, he gets into a conversation with Jesus. We're told that the Holy Spirit was prompting him to ask the questions. Jesus said to him, everyone who's of the truth knows what the truth is. And Pilate says, what is truth? Now, let me ask you, can you answer that question? What is truth? What does Jesus say? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But when Jesus, when Judas, when Pilate asked the question, if you read that verse, it says, he says, what is truth? And then it says, and then he turned and he went out. He turned his back on the answer. And when he came back, was Jesus answering his questions? No. The only time Jesus spoke was when he says, don't you know that I have power to release you or to crucify you? And he says, you would have no power except my Father's given to you. But the one who's behind all this is more guilty than you are. But that doesn't keep him out of the second resurrection. Well, I could go on. There's more here. But we have to understand that Jesus Christ, he didn't just do this for Pilate. He didn't do this for Judas. He didn't just do this for his disciples. He's doing it for us today. He wants us to have a personal relationship with him. We talked about a verse today in, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Then shall many say, Lord, Lord, look at all the good things I've done. And what's the Lord say in verse 23? I never knew you. We did not have a relationship. You didn't wake up first thing in the morning and talk to me. The first thing you did in the morning was to see who texted you during the night. If you didn't wake up in the middle of the night to see who was texting you. My daughter has a habit. She's got me into it right now. When she wakes up in the middle of the night, she just lays there and prays. If you wake up in the middle of the night, you know why? God wants to talk. Listen to him. Talk to him. He wants us to have a relationship. Because if you don't have a relationship, we're going to be lost. 
We're only saved by knowing who he is. I've got to do one more thing. Let me just jump over it. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I know I'm running late, but hey, what else is there to do, huh? You know, just if you think I'm talking too long, read Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12, if you haven't already read it. First part of the first angel's message. What's it say? Fear God. There's our problem. We don't understand what it means. We think about fear God as this. Fear the weather. Fear everything happening around you. I once was on a trip, and I've got a picture of my truck, but this is, I can't find it on my computer. I was on a tour sometime. I'm always touring. I came home, and a tree had fallen across my poor little Nissan pickup truck. Smashed it, poor thing. Okay? What does the insurance company call that? Act of God. Is that an act of God? No, that's just a tree that got pine bark beetle. It got dried out, then it rained, it got heavy, and it fell over on my truck. That had not, got nothing to do with it. Fear God. I have feared two people in my life. This is one of them. You know who that is? That's my father. My sisters and I were afraid of him. We, if we were coming home from school, we saw his car in the driveway. We didn't want to go home. Is that the way God is? No, that's not the way God is. The second person I feared in my life? That one right there. You know who that is? That's my mama. Oh, let me go back. That's my parents right there. But my mother, I fear her in a totally different way than I feared my father. I fear doing anything that will hurt my mother. And I've done it many times in my life, and it hurts me to now to think about it. She's 96 years old. I don't even think she knows who I am. But if we could get like that with about Jesus Christ, we would stop sinning. But you only do that by knowing who he is. Yeah. Fear God. We should fear that we're going to hurt him by the lives that we live. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful that you love us even if we don't love you. But we're thankful that you are long-suffering. You could have come many years ago, but you're waiting for your people to get ready. You're waiting for every single person in this room to give their hearts wholly and completely to you. You will do everything you can to save our souls. We pray, Father, that you would help us not to pre present a perverse will and thus frustrate your grace. We pray, Father, that you would complete the good work you've begun in us, that we might live with you forever. But more importantly than that, we can stop your suffering now. And we thank you and we praise you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God for the message, and thank you, Dr. Miller, to be an instrument in God's hand. Um, before we send you home, we would like to um, give you a few announcements. Tomorrow, we'll meet here at the same time. Um, 7 o'clock, we start the meeting, so if you want to enjoy Judy's um, um, songs, please come before 7. So come at uh, 6.45 so you can um, enjoy the songs and be able to also fellowship. We also have tonight... have a visitor tonight. His name is Jovan. Can you wait for us? Amen. Welcome. Really happy to have you here with us. And we have a gift for you, if you don't mind to just step forward and get your gift. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jovan. 
And we hope to see you again tomorrow, same time. And um, who invited Jovan? Annalyn. Okay, thank you, Annalyn, for inviting Jovan. And Giovanni? All right. I misspelled, or I didn't misspell it right, so it's Giovanni. And also, for our members, we have also a gift for one female. So I will try to shuffle today so that it doesn't look like. Okay, is there something with the Siago family, huh? Joanne. Joanne May Siago. Okay. Yesterday it was your aunt. Today it's you. Um, so probably have to change your name to Siago to get one tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll have another message, and the title is Don't Be a Pharisee. I think it's a very interesting one. Witnessing with urgency. So Come back tomorrow night to hear more about what the Lord has for us. Have a good night. I will see you tomorrow. Remember questions. If you have any questions, health-related or whatever we learned tonight, and you, you still want you know, to dig in more, write your questions and you know, uh, give it to um, Annalyn or Martha on your way out. We have you know, a light meal for those who didn't have a chance to eat dinner. So you can also join us in fellowshipping together. Have a good night and see you tomorrow at the same time. God bless you.